covering news where you live. This is 5 News. Thanks for joining us here today for the latest news where you live. I'm Erica Thomas. Let's get you caught up on what's going on around five country. The first and only debate featuring all three candidates for Arkansas governor took place Friday. It's the latest in a series of debates produced by Arkansas PBS. Republican Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Democrat Chris Jones, and Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. spent about an hour going head to head on a number of issues. Those include finding common ground, education, and inflation relief. Well, I would definitely like to work on occupational licensing to give people more opportunities to start businesses and from right from where they are. We need to allow them to keep more money in their pocket. And we're going to do that by continuing to responsibly phase out the state income tax, rewarding people's hard work instead of penalizing it. PB&J is a long-term solution. Preschool broadband and jobs, providing education at the outset, because we know that kids that go to pre-K are more likely to read by third grade, and they're more likely to have a living wage job, and they're less likely to go to prison. You can watch the full debate happening right now at 5newsonline.com. And for more details on what you need to know before you head to the ballot box, just text the word vote to the number on your screen. That's 479-785-5000. We'll send you a link with voting information for Arkansas and Oklahoma. We're going to find your polling locations and much more. Well, that was just a taste of what's going to be playing at the Fayetteville Film Festival. Saturday is the last and biggest day where filmmakers are competing for the grand prize of $2,000 to make their next film. But Wim Filmmaker tells us it's not all about the money. It's so fulfilling to be able to show my film on a big screen because at the end of the day, I did set out to make something that means something, but it's a, it's a fun movie. It's a, it's a crowd pleaser. It's so much fun to watch you know, on the big screen with, all the, uh, with, with, this, with the sound blaring really loud and that music going. The Fayetteville Film Fest only features films from people who live in the natural state. If you have time, check out the Film Fest because everything wraps up on Saturday until next year. Well, as we head into the weekend, you're probably thinking corn mazes, haunted houses, pumpkin patches. So how does the weather look? Let's check in with meteorologist Stephen Elmore. Yeah, Erica, it is going to be windy this weekend. We've seen warmer temperatures over the past couple of days, and it's all because we're seeing these wind gusts starting to peak near around 40 miles an hour by the time we get into the weekend. Taking a look at Saturday morning already, we're seeing 40 miles an hour uh, wind gusts across northwest Arkansas and the River Valley. And if we just let this run through, you continue to see all those wind gusts continuing to pick up throughout the next uh, a couple of days over the weekend. Now, we still have our burn bands, so again, we could see maybe a red flag warning pop up this weekend due to the high wind gusts and that we're still seeing those drought like conditions all across five country. A few counties that were dropped off due to the heavy rain this last weekend and more rain is back into the forecast by the time we start the work week. We are still under a high to moderate risk for that wildfire danger throughout the rest of the weekend and our updated drought monitor is showing us that we're still mainly in that level three or level two risk for our drought like conditions. Now that rain chance does pick up after we get past this weekend. Again, it's going to be very windy this weekend, but come Monday, that's when that cold front's going to arrive. Monday night heading into Tuesday, we're expecting some widespread rain, and that'll help start the process of trying to get us out of this drought. All right, Stephen, thanks. People living near the landfill in Tawny Town are raising concerns about waste management expanding that landfill. People who live nearby say they're already dealing with loud noises, trash and debris littering the streets, as well as odors and air quality concerns. Tawny Town's mayor plans to present a resolution expressing the city's opposition at the next city council meeting. She says ultimately the city has no authority on the matter. Only state regulators can stop it. She just wants to send a clear message. If a company came in today and wanted to put a landfill on Arbor Acres Avenue, they would be denied. I do not think the landfill should be allowed to expand. If it is allowed to expand, the many problems that we are now having will greatly increase. We did reach out to Waste Management for comment on this resolution and concerns neighbors have. While the company wouldn't comment on the trash problem, it sent us a statement that reads in part, quote, Our Eco Vista landfill is an essential piece of infrastructure in northwest Arkansas, providing the only Class 1 and Class 4 landfill in the growing region. We look forward to continuing the expansion process. You can view much more on this story at 5newsonline.com. You may have noticed the Razorback Greenway has a new look. The trail is long. We're talking 40 miles from Mount Kessler to Lake Bella Vista. 
Greenway manager Tristan Hill tells 5 News that until now, the Greenway was a collection of trails. In the past, each city managed its own portion of the trail, but now it's coming together to make the Greenway whole under one brand. Now, the top of the mile markers have seven different colors, meaning to represent which of the seven cities you're in. Holidays are fast approaching, and we all know it's a good idea to get a jump on your shopping, but what about shipping this year? Well, we know those delays are just part of the holiday season, and that can spell trouble if you wait too long. Julissa Garza shows us why you may want to get those gifts shipped out early. With the holidays inching closer, stores like Domestic Domestic are already seeing more customers. The holiday shopping season has 100% began, and it seems to be stronger than, than probably we've ever experienced. Owner Heather Smith says they've made sure to prepare this year to help prevent any supply chain issues. We've brought in a lot more product this year than we ever have before. Smith store ships items to customers here in the natural state and across the country. If you come into the store and need something to ship to grandma in St. Louis, like it's still free. So you can buy your gifts here and we'll wrap them and then send them. With holiday shopping underway, they're encouraging shoppers to get a head start on shipping as well to prevent delays. Nobody wants to be disappointed, and we certainly don't want to be the ones that disappoint people. The U.S. Postal Service agrees that getting an early start is the way to go. We will start in late November of delivering on Sundays for the holiday season. Julie Chudy with USPS says there's extra precautions you can take, like making sure information is inside your package, not just on the outside. In case something happens to that label and when our um, loss department opens it, you still have the name and address and we can go ahead and ship it on. The Postal Service is also making sure they have more hands on deck to help ensure nothing arrives late. We are fully staffed and ready for the holidays. USPS isn't alone. Other big shippers like UPS are doing the same thing, staffing up ahead of the rush, which also means seasonal jobs for people looking for work. We're bringing in about 20 seasonal part-time management, um, roughly 100 driver helpers. Bottom line, don't wait too long, or you might just miss out this holiday season. In Little Rock, Jalissa Garza, 5 News. Now let's go to some of the top news you might have missed this week. The latest in the investigation into the death of an inmate at the Crawford County Jail. Jacob Allen Jones died Saturday. He's 26 years old from Van Buren. He was arrested last Friday afternoon and brought to the Crawford County Jail. Less than 24 hours later, he died. Now his family and their attorney are asking what happened and why he didn't get any medical care for hours before his death. Sheriff Jimmy DeMonte confirmed no employees have been placed on leave following the death of Jones. An investigation is underway to determine what happened. Sheriff DeMonte also told 5 News that Arkansas State Police have been asked to help in the investigation. But Bill Sadler with ASP tells 5 News they will not investigate because the inmate died in the care of a doctor. A seven-year veteran of the Benton County Sheriff's Office is on administrative leave after a deadly force shooting last weekend. The Sheriff's Office identified him as Detective Vector Zhang. He was involved in the deadly shooting of Nelson Amos last Saturday in Decatur. Arkansas State Police are now handling this investigation and say the shooting happened after Zhang encountered Amos driving a tractor down the road and holding a gun. A deadly ATV crash leaves the town of Cedarville in mourning. 13-year-old Jacob Wallace died last Sunday, just two days before his middle school returned to class after fall break. 5 News reporter Ian Taylor shared his life. As the cool autumn wind blows outside, the hallways of Cedarville Middle School are warm but somber as students return to class Tuesday, missing one of their own. It's a tremendous loss for our community, and getting that phone call is one that you never want to hear. A four-wheeler crash on Sunday evening took the life of a beloved student and friend. Jacob Wallace turned 13 just a little more than two weeks before the accident. His family and principal say his personality was larger than life. Jacob was a sweet boy, and he was funny, and he liked to joke and laugh. He was well-liked, loved, and a lot of people said it, but he has a very contagious smile. He just loved to smile, and his smile was just so sweet. He played on the junior high basketball and football teams. Coach Max Washhausen brought the football team together Tuesday to talk about the loss. As they mourn, they plan to honor the memory of number 55. If there's a, someone that's passed, uh, I always try to, you know, find something special about that person and, and try to personally carry that on. The team is doing just that with helmet decals of Jacob's number. The Wallace family will bury Jacob in his football jersey, a testament to just how much he loved the game. He would have loved that. 
Uh, definitely. His uncle, Robert McDonner, says the family is still processing the loss, saying nothing could ever have prepared them for a life so full to be cut short. I'd give anything, anything to change it, but you can't, and you know, you just gotta, you gotta learn to move on somehow. Um, I wish I could have protected him. Cedarville Middle School provided counselors to all students and staff Tuesday, now pouring support, helping Jacob's family through their grief. They've helped tremendously, um, and words can express how, how thankful we are for the community that's really supported us during this time. In Cedarville, covering news where you live, Ian Taylor, 5 News. The city of Fort Smith is warning people about the dangers and exposure to fentanyl laced drugs as overdoses are on the rise in the area. Five News reporter Rachel Williams spoke to Fort Smith police and EMS about this ongoing issue. In the last year, Fort Smith police and Fort Smith EMS say they've seen an increase in fentanyl overdoses. According to the city, between the police officers, EMS, firefighters, and the individuals at the scene of an overdose, there have been nearly 200 doses of Narcan administered. 66 of those cases were confirmed to be fentanyl overdoses. 31 were suspected to be uh, fentanyl overdose cases and 33 were unknown where pills were used and it's just unknown what the pill was. Fort Smith EMS says since September 1st, they've responded to 56 overdose incidents with people ranging in age from 18 to 45. According to the DEA, in a medical setting, fentanyl is typically used to treat patients with chronic or severe pain. However, the DEA says illegal fentanyl is being made in labs and smuggled into the U.S. and distributed across the nation. And it's often mixed with other drugs. You are playing with fire and, um, and you have no idea. You may have a um, intended outcome um, when... Uh, you know, when ingesting something like this, but the outcomes are unknown and the outcome could be death. According to the DEA, fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin and 100 times more powerful than morphine. So two milligrams of fentanyl is considered a lethal dose. That's equivalent to 10 to 15 grains of table salt. So just to put this all into perspective, this small amount can risk your life. Fort Smith Police is now adding proactive measures to their workforce by having every officer carry Narcan. We received a grant in 2021 that helped us to purchase Narcan so every officer could carry it. Uh, officers have administered Narcan uh, in the line of duty for people who have overdosed and there's no doubt that they saved these individuals' lives. In case you ever witness an overdose, Fort Smith PD and EMS recommend carrying naloxone. It comes in two different forms. One can be injected, while the other is a nasal spray. The police department is also working with other local, state, and federal law enforcement to prosecute drug dealers in the area. That was Rachel Williams reporting. Switching gears now, the world's largest hot dog franchise is coming to Arkansas, and the first store will open in five country. Wiener Schnitzel says it's gearing up to build 20 new restaurants throughout the state over the next 12 years. The very first Arkansas store will be going in on East Centerton Boulevard in Bentonville. Wiener Schnitzel serves chili dogs, cheese fries, all that type of food. The company says there are already plans to begin building three stores in northwest Arkansas to jumpstart development. Florida citrus growers anticipated their first good crop in several years, but Hurricane Ian laid waste to much of that harvest. Most Florida oranges end up as juice, but now Ian's damage is being felt at grocery store checkouts across the country. Christian Benavitez reports. Looking around his orchard, fifth generation Florida citrus grower Roy Petaway sees dollar signs in the loss column. We're estimating at least 40% of our crop is on the ground and un unusable and unmarketable. Hurricane Ian drenched Florida citrus groves last month, sending oranges to the ground and causing tree damage growers haven't yet fully assessed. When we have trees that will all of a sudden rapidly die in the next six months to eight months, those can be attributed then to either water issues, wind issues. More than 375,000 acres in Florida are devoted to citrus, fueling a nearly $6.7 billion industry in the state. 
Orange production is already down 32% from the previous season, and preliminary estimates put citrus losses from Ian as high as $304 million. Growers only recently shook the lingering grip of 2017's Hurricane Irma. This is no doubt a gut, gut punch to an industry that we believe is on the cusp of being able to stabilize and start to rebuild. Those factors could all put the squeeze to consumers with higher juice prices at the grocery store. With inflation already so high, I mean, what kind of increases are we talking about here? I'd say at least 20%. Patrick Penfield is a professor of supply chain practice at Syracuse University and says the impact on consumers could get even worse. California is now the number one producer of oranges. But I would anticipate probably next year is when you're going to start hearing about how they have a shortage also. And that's because they just don't have enough water. For now, producers will have to rely more heavily on those California oranges and imported citrus from South America. Thanks for watching. For the latest news and weather where you live, I'm Erica Thomas. Have a great day.